Hi, my name is Tom and you are at level number 21 out of 30 easy steps to learn everything about Einstein's special relativity. This level is optional. As you may have seen in previous levels, I tend to have a section which is for everyone, then a section which is for daredevils, and then a section which is for rock climbers. In this case, this section is a daredevil only piece of work. Um, so it's optional. You can just say, okay, I believe it. I don't want to have a sneak preview of the Lorenz transformation. I'm going to level number 22. That's fine. But if you are a daredevil, you can derive a significant piece of the Lorenz transformation just by using the knowledge of the previous level, applying the theorem of Pythagoras. Are you ready? I am. GP, hit it. So, what we are going to do is not derive the full Lorentz transformations. No, we are going to uh, get to its uh, Lorentz factor, the gamma, which you've seen in previous levels. It's for daredevils. It's, it's, we are going to do math, but it's not that difficult, I would say. It's, it's high school math, and it's tedious, but it's not difficult. So, if you want to be able to derive the Lorentz uh, factor, the gamma, uh, which is maybe the most mind-blowing constant in all of physics in all time, you have to stay tuned. You can do this. It's not difficult. I promise. Here we go. So first, before, oh, before we go, let's look in deriving polarized transformation. Einstein, of course, did, uh, well, Lorentz did with many others. I talked about extensively in uh, level 19. Uh, uh, we saw uh, like 50, 60 years of mathematicians trying to get there, and then Lorenz and Poincaré, they made it to the finish. Einstein did it again in 1905, a little bit different, and we will talk about this in level number 25, where we will do the actual derivation of Einstein, which will be rock climbing. It's really difficult. Um, he also did it in 1916. If you go online and you look at uh, how Einstein derived Lorenz transformation, uh, you will almost always be redirected to the one he did in 1916, but the one in 1905 is the original one. There's even a Wikipedia page on the derivations of the Lorentz transformation. So many are there. There are also some pieces where they derive Lorentz transformations without assuming that the speed of light is the same for all observers. I was really intrigued by that. In fact, it made me look for answers. It made me make this whole YouTube channel because I just couldn't believe that the speed of light is the same for all observers. And then I found out that you can get there without doing the assumption. And that will be level number 23, my personal highlight of all 30 levels. So the setup, we have a train. We call this train observer number two. There's a woman on the train. She's drinking a glass of wine. She has her own measuring device. So if she sees an event E, she can measure it with her measuring device. She also has a clock. So when she sees an event E, she can write down when it happened the time of the event through the eyes of observer 2, the coordinate x of the event according to observer number 2. There is a light in the ceiling, and the ceiling and the floor of the cabin are d meters apart. And what she's going to do is she's going to switch on the light, and when the light starts to travel from the ceiling downwards to the floor, She's going to measure the time it took. And when she knows how long it took, and she knows how the distance was, d, she can calculate the speed of light. So here we have my famous uh, notation, which I will always practice. Uh, so we write down the x location of some event from some perspective, the t of some event from some perspective, the velocity of something from some perspective. 
In this case, Observer 2 also has its own x-axis. And in this case, we will introduce the y-axis as well. I mean, uh, I've told you, I think, in many levels that uh, Einstein's special relativity deals with one dimension only, x. And we just ignore y because there's not much going on in the y and the z direction. Uh, there's only uh, spooky stuff going on in the x direction, which is true. But now we need the y-axis as well. Then I have observer number one, which is stationary. Well, stationary. It's at rest relative to the track, relative to the ground. And we as, as viewers are also uh, stuck to the ground. So it's observer one. And he also has his own measuring device and its own clock and its own frame of reference. And observer one says that observer two is moving at a constant velocity v to the right. So the velocity of observer two through the eyes of observer one is v. They also sync. So at the beginning, they are at the same location. So the y axis are exactly, you know, at the same point and they sync their clocks. So both clocks are set to zero and, and, and they say this is our origin. This is what we call zero meters for us both. And then the train starts moving eh, away. This is the setup. Now, let's imagine the woman with the wine. She will switch on the light. That will be event number one. And she will do so exactly at t is zero on her clock. So the time of this event one, switching on the light, through the eyes of observer two, the woman with the wine, equals zero. Two, event number two is the light hits the bottom, a sensor, um, which is a distant d away. Eh? And this will happen at another time, sometime later. And she will write down this time as the time of event number two through the eyes of observer two. Here we see it in graphics. There's a distance d, well, distance d eh, through the eyes of observer two, between the ceiling and the bottom. And at event one, she writes down, uh, I used a vector, the, uh, vector notation here, but you can follow, I guess. And uh, the x coordinate is zero of event one, and the time is zero, because at t is zero, we also uh, uh, said that the x was at zero. And then sometime later, the light hits the floor. And because Observer 2 has no reference points around uh, her, she will say, my x is still zero. You know, nothing moved. The light didn't move. You know, I'm, uh, everyone else is moving, but I did not move. You know, the only thing that moved is the light in the y direction, but nothing moved in the x direction. So the x coordinate of the second event for her will be zero as well. But the time of the second event, of course, will be sometime later. And then she does the calculation. What is the speed of light? Well, she says that's easy. That's the distance traveled divided by the time it took. And there you go. We have equation number one. The speed of light through the eyes of observer two is the distance d divided by the timestamp of event number two through the eyes of observer two. Easy. Easy. Right. Now let's look how the world is, is, uh, is viewed by observer number one. This is what observer one will see. He will see the light being switched on at a specific location. And then the train moves to the right while the light beam is going down and will hit the bottom floor at some different location x than the first event. So he will see the light going like this instead of like going this. So the event number one, when the light is switched on, observer one will say that's at zero, zero. Because at zero, zero, and the x coordinate at zero, and t is zero, they synced, right? And event number two, when light hits the bottom, then, you know, it has been, it, it, it moved, the train moved. How much did the train move? Well, its velocity, v of observer two, and through the eyes of observer one, multiplied by the time 
it took the light to go from the ceiling to the floor, which is the time of event 2 minus the time of event 1 through the eyes of observer 1. So this is it. Different equations for observer 1. And observer 1 can also now calculate the uh, speed of light. He will say, well, that's the distance traveled, which is this distance, right, the slanted one, not, not going down, divided by the time it took. And because, you know, the first event is at t is zero, and the equations simplify to d over t. Well, what is d, the slanted one? And now we can use the theorem of Pythagoras. Um, and here it is, and we know that d through the eyes of observer 1, this one, is the same as the d vertically through the eyes of observer 2. Why? Because the d through the eyes of observer 2, the up and down, is the same for observer 1. And in Einstein's relativity, nothing funky is going on in the y direction. So both observers will agree about the height of the cabin. So that one squared plus the x and the delta x squared. And here it is. And then you take the square root eh, if you want to apply the theorem of Pythagoras. And then you can just fill in eh, what we already know. And we get equation number two for the speed of light, three eyes of observer. One. Ha! Now we can. Oh yeah, this is what I just said. Now we can compare notes, right? These two equations, the speed of light through the eyes of observer 2 and the speed of light of observer 1, needs to be the same because that's what experiments tell us. It needs to be C, the speed of light. Well, let's start with the second equation. Let's bring T to the other side. There it is. Now divide both uh, pieces, uh, left and right of the equal sign, by the square root of d through the eyes of observer 2, which is the same as d through the observer, uh, observer 1, but you know we keep uh, using the same variable here. So here it is, I just did this. Then, if I repeat that equation, we can do some cleanup. And you see that uh, d squared, d squared is uh, on top and on the bottom, so we can put a 1 in there, so we get this one. And now we square both sides and we do some shoveling. You can do this yourself on paper, and we get this equation. Let's continue. We multiply both sides with d squared, then we get this one. Now we isolate t of event number 2 through the eyes of observer 1, we get this one. And we write it a little bit different by bringing the C outside. And we can write it like this. This is just basic algebra, right? Level number 2, basic algebra. We're shoveling and substituting. It looks complex, but it isn't, you know. If you just take the time and you, and you, and you, and you concentrate and you focus, this is not that difficult. These are really basic uh, steps. So here it is. Now we are going to bring in equation number one, the observer two perspective. Observer two, the woman with the wine said, the speed of light is d observer two divided by the t of uh, event number two is seen through the eyes of observer two. So these two need to be the same. Well, we can, of course, plug this in, and then we get this equation. The time it took the light to travel from the ceiling to the floor through the eyes of observer 1 equals the time the light took to go from the ceiling to the floor through the eyes of observer 2 multiplied by 1 over the square root of 1 minus v over c squared. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the famous Lorentz constant. Is it called? A factor. The Lorentz factor. Oh, I'm so nervous now. The Lorentz factor. Gamma. There it is. Boom. We have time dilation. They call this 
time and dilation. We will do this in future levels. Eh? When we, uh, I think in level 26 or 27, we will do time dilation, do exercises, do real numbers, etc. Eh? But for now, let's recap. The speed of light from both observers had to be the same. We did some mumbo jumbo. And then we found out this equation, that the ratio of the time it took the light to go from the ceiling to the floor of observer 1 versus observer 2 is some factor gamma. And here it is. And this factor will always be larger than 1. Just C. I mean, uh, V is, is below C. Eh? Because if, if the velocity is greater than the velocity of light, then we get a negative number of which we need to take the square root. Well, we just can't take the square root of negative numbers. Well, even mathematicians can, and they introduce another secret symbol, but we are going to completely ignore this. In the real world, we cannot take the square root of a negative number. So, v has to be smaller than c, and if v is smaller than c, 1 over vc squared, is smaller than 1, and 1 divided by something smaller than 1 is bigger, larger than 1. And therefore, the time on the clock of observer 1 is always ahead of the time of the clock of observer 2. Just let it sink in. I mean, this is... In 1905, when Einstein fully accepted this as a consequence of his theory, they did not give him the Nobel Prize for this one. They gave him the Nobel Prize for something else. He wrote in the same paper. Well, he wrote four papers uh, at the same time. But this was just too crazy. This is like super Nobel Prize stuff, right? The clock of Observer 2 ticks slower than the clock of Observer 1 because Observer 2 is moving. In other words, the stationary clock is always ahead, or the moving clock is always behind, or the moving time scale is dilated. So if you have like 10 seconds here, and you take clock number 2, and you, ex you pull the scale, boop, you get 10 seconds in Observer 1, and maybe 3 seconds of Observer 2. Its time scale is dilated, dilated. And that's why they call this time dilation. Moving clocks tick slower. I want to thank you for watching and I hope to see you at the next level. GP, hit it!